Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar. My name is Sam Fankhauser. I'm co-director of the Grants and Research Institute at the London School of Economics. Um, we are uh, introducing to you today uh, a new database, a new tool uh, that we've developed uh, together with the Sabin Center at the Columbia Law School. When I say a new tool, it isn't actually that new. We have had a database in climate change laws for a couple of years, but what we are introducing to you today is a database that is significantly bigger, has much more coverage, and also uh, introduces uh, climate change litigation as well as legislation. What we have assembled is a database with well over 1,200 climate change laws in over 160 countries, um, about 250 or so court cases in 25 countries. So there's a lot of climate change lawmaking that we are covering in this database. It's a great tool, we hope, uh, not just for researchers, but also for policymakers and people who are interested in climate change information. Um, it's just two things I want to do before we get started properly. Uh, the first is a couple of thank yous, and the second is to quickly uh, tell you how the running order works this, uh, in this webinar. The thank yous, first of all, to uh, colleagues at the Sabian Center, whom you can hopefully see on the screen uh, next to us here, and you will hear from Mike Berger in a second, the Executive Director at Sabian. Uh, I should also thank uh, a lot of parliamentarians who have helped us putting together the database and have helped us to do the quality control and the checks that all the, the laws and the things we cover are, are accurate and up to date. Uh, many of those parliamentarians are member either of the Interparliamentary Union or Globe International, two organizations with whom we have worked very closely uh, for, for many, many years. So the running order before we get started. Uh, in a minute, I will uh, ask Mike Berger to give a few introductory remarks, give his perspective from the Sabin Center. We then move into two presentations back to back, one by Michal Nachmani here at LSE, and the other by Justin Gundelach in, uh, in New York at the Sabin Center. Um, Michal will cover legislation, Justin will cover litigation. After those presentations, we open it up for questions and answers. Uh, you may ask, how do we ask our questions? Um, you should have in your chat box the, op the opportunity to uh, write questions to us. You can do that throughout the presentations as and when the questions occur to you. We will assemble them here and uh, make sense of them, bundle them as necessary, and, and then ask people here in the in the uh, in, in, in around the table to, to answer them. So that's the plan. Um, we are recording uh, this webinar and the recording should be uh, available on the website shortly after we finish. We have about 90 minutes maximum, somewhere between an hour and 90 minutes. Depends a little bit on how many questions you ask. So with that, let me pass on to Mike in New York. Thank you, Sam. Uh, good morning, and to those of us, uh, or those of you joining us on the other side of the Atlantic, good afternoon, and to those of us, those of you joining us uh, elsewhere on the world, good evening, I suppose. Um, I'd like to briefly acknowledge at the outset the suffering and the strain instigated by this weekend's terrorist attack in London, and to voice our sympathy for those who have suffered both directly and indirectly from it. My name is Michael Berger, and I'm the executive director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law and a research scholar and lecturer here at Columbia Law School. The Sabin Center has as its mission to develop and disseminate innovative legal strategies and techniques to combat climate change. And we work uh, on both mitigation and adaptation at every, at every scale of governance, from local, local land use laws to international cooperation under the UNFCCC, and yes, even still the Paris Agreement. A key part of our work involves the conceptualization, construction, and distribution of information and knowledge resources for 
practitioners and researchers in the field of climate change law and policy. In this vein, we have long maintained online databases of climate change litigation that chart lawsuits both inside the United States and around the world. On January 20th of this year, we launched our climate deregulation tracker, which keeps tabs on efforts by the Trump administration and the current Congress to unwind the Obama administration's top climate change policies. And it was in this vein that we came to partner with the Bantam Institute on the climate change laws of the world website. A little bit of background. In 2012, the Sabin Center compiled a preliminary database of climate change laws in a small number of countries outside the United States, including both national climate change legislation and sectoral legislation with a clear climate focus or nexus. Approximately two years ago, we realized that this section of our website was actually among the most visited, most popular parts, despite its rather small scale at that, at that point. Researchers were coming from literally all around the world to access these resources. So we decided to expand the scope of our coverage and incorporate more countries. Naturally, we consulted with the GLOBE study uh, compiled by Michal Nachmani and her colleagues at Grantham. Uh, among other resources, eventually covering over a hundred countries altogether, providing links to the original documents of those of those laws. We are extremely excited to be partnering with the team at Grantham. Their dedication to the project of mapping and analyzing climate laws uh, is extraordinary, and the intelligence and skill that they have brought to this project and this partnership is visible in the high quality of the database and the, and its utility. It is also visible in the research they have already begun to produce around it, uh, including the presentation that we'll hear from Michal shortly. Our hope is that the tool will be of use to lawyers and policy professionals around the world working to implement the Paris Agreement, which we are confident will survive Donald Trump's ill-informed and impetuous decision announced last week. We also hope it will be of further use to researchers working on a variety of analytic projects to better understand the trajectory and state of climate change law. Last month, we collaborated with UN Environment to publish a report on global climate change litigation, which my colleague Justin will discuss in more detail shortly. The report relied on the non-US litigation chart that we have previously developed and which has been thoroughly incorporated into the new joint website. We are very much excited to continue to work with Grantham to maintain this website and to see it evolve in the months and years ahead. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Sam, to further the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mike, also for the, for the kind words. We are uh, as excited as you are about the collaboration and about the climate change laws of the world database that we, that we have put together. Uh, let me now uh, introduce you to Michal Nachmani and Justin Gundelach, who will give back-to-back -back their presentations uh, and the slides that will uh, show us on how that tool looks and how it might be useful to, to people like you, to researchers and policy experts. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you to all my colleagues here and uh, across multiple oceans those who have um, assembled today around the table and those who have been a part of this project that has been going on since 2010 to collect and disseminate and share the knowledge uh, about climate change laws and about recently more about climate change court cases around the world. Um, a lot of partners around the table, uh, the Columbia Law School, um, IPU and GLOBE and of course the British Academy which has been supporting us um, as well in this, um, in this project. Since 2010, we've been um, collecting here at the Grantham information about climate change laws and the audiences which we have reached, both with our earlier edition printed versions um, that started with 16 countries and, um, and have grown wider to cover over 160 countries today, have been presented in multiple venues around the world and we're very happy that you're sitting with us today to, um, to learn about climate change laws of the world. I'm going to dive um, deep into the um, 
um, website just so you can have a very detailed understanding of how you might make use of it. And I will finish off by uh, a short review of trends in climate legislation. So if you go on the um, main page of the um, governance and legislation program in the um, Grantham website, the address is here on the top of it, on the top of the page, you will find um, two main icons. One of them is the map icon and one of them is, the, is titled Climate Change Laws of the World. These are the two main interfaces through which you can access the database. Further below on the page you will find related research and policy publications and also events such as the one we're attending right now. Clicking on the map will bring you to an interactive country map covering currently 164 countries with the look to expand even more in the future. If you hover above a country such as the hovering above India at the moment, you will see some basic information on it. You will see that India has 11 laws and policies, what are its uh, emissions, and what is it, the percentage of its emissions of global emissions. The little blobs on the map are not accidents, they are uh, the smaller countries that you can um, click on and get information. You can also select a country from the drop down menu on the top left hand side of the, of the map. And clicking on one of those uh, countries or selecting them from the drop down will open a small frame with key indicators for a country, as well as a link to a detailed country profile. Clicking on the full country profile, you will see this window. Um, the main thing you will see is the legislative portfolio. So this, the example shown on the screen now shows Kenya's laws, uh, the Climate Change Act of 2016 and the Energy Act of 2006. Um, the laws compiled here are laws passed by the legislative branch, so like parliaments or national assemblies. But we also recognize that countries pass their climate policies by the executive branch, by governments. And the next tab, right next to the legislative portfolio, is the executive portfolio where you can find those policies. So here uh, you can find the national environment policy and others. Clicking on either a law or a policy will give you a detailed description of that law with a summary, with an English summary of the law as uh, compiled by a team of researchers here at the Grantham. We currently have summaries for over 850 laws in about 100 countries, and we are working on expanding those summaries to the rest of the laws. Going back to the country profiles, for 99 countries, we have a detailed summary of approach to climate change on a national level, uh, explaining the country's uh, main efforts around climate change, not only legislative and executive, but also um, its involvement with it, uh, the international uh, regime and so on. There is also a list of indicators, mainly emissions and targets. A short description of the legislative process in a country, and those are the country profiles. Going back to the main screen of the research programs of the research program, you can see that we can also click on the other side on climate change laws of the world, which currently has the two logos of the Grantham and the Sabin. Clicking on that will bring you to our search page, which is the searchable database, which, as Sam mentioned earlier, has over 1,200 laws from 164 countries and 250 laws currently from 20, uh, sorry, 250 court cases from uh, 25 countries. Starting with the legislation search, you can see on the left-hand side various uh, indicators that you can search on. For example, if I search by region um, or uh, by year, by country importance as emitter and so on, and click on the search button, I will get my selection of laws. Right now I searched for laws in South Asia that have been passed from 2013 and onwards. As you can see, we have 10 results. Clicking on the download results will open a download screen and the results are downloadable in a CSV or Excel format. Um, and uh, the, bottom, the bottom part of the screen shows you what the results page would look like. I will go very briefly through the litigation search box, um, although Justin will talk about litigation more in detail uh, shortly. Uh, again, the litigation search box allows you to search 
for court cases by year, by country, by side. So you can see if a, a court case was um, uh, opened or, um, uh, or responded to by an individual, a government, a corporation, or an NGO. Um, there are various categories to those cases. As you can see on the screen, these are cases challenging legislation or policies, cases on information or disclosure, cases dealing with uh, protection or loss and damage, or cases uh, addressing administrative issues. Again, you can filter on mitigation, adaptation um, cases, or on both. And you can see if cases are open, closed, or under appeal. The litigation currently has a free text search option, which the legislation search will soon have as well. Again, the litigation results are as well downloadable. Here, for example, is the search on all court cases uh, opened in India uh, in which the defendant, defendant is the Indian government. So we, we, we can see that we have nine cases responding to those criteria. Clicking on individual case will take you to a detailed description of the case. You can see the year opened, the status of the case, the jurisdiction, if there are any laws that particularly govern this case, is it a mitigation or adaptation case, an English summary of the case as um, compiled by the team at the Sabin Center, and some other criteria such as the core objective of the case, the categories, the side types, and of course the decision. And for as many cases as possible, we attempt to include supporting documentation for, uh, for the case. So this is, the, this is our website, and um, feel free to roam through it. What is more important, and this is uh, an especially important appeal now that we have uh, a large in international audience listening, hopefully, to the seminar now. If you see anything that is not consistent with your knowledge about what's going on in your country, if there is a law that ha has passed recently and we do not capture it, if you're aware of climate change litigation cases, which we do not yet cover, please email us or contact us and let us know so we can bring this, what we hope is a comprehensive and uh, all-encompassing website to be even better. I will now uh, say a few short uh, words about the trends in climate change legislation. This is based on a report that we launched about a month ago in Bonn and the intercessional climate negotiations. And, um, the report itself is available on our website, and we will provide after the webinar also a link to go to that. You can see um, on your screen a, a photo from the press conference that we held in Bonn recently launching this report. So when climate change uh, came to the international agenda and with the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, the map of climate laws was pretty blank. You can see on your screens now, very light blues, which represent a low number of laws in various countries. And if we um, flick 20 years forward, we can see that from the 60-something uh, laws that was together in all of those countries, we now look at 1,200 laws, more than 1,200 laws, which is a 20-fold increase in 20 years, signaling what a strong uh, direction climate change legislation has taken in these years. If we look at the number of new climate change laws introduced every year from 92, so from uh, Rio onwards, we can see that the first few years were pretty weak with uh, just under 20 laws annually every, um, uh, every year in those years, um, with a surge around 2009, around Copenhagen, towards around Paris. The recent uh, slowing down in passage of legislation is uh, something that we are looking at and, and um, thinking um, in multiple ways about it. One way to think about it is that enough laws have been uh, passed already and now we are moving towards implementation. And another way to look at it is that we still will be needing to see laws, especially as with, Paris, with the Paris Agreement, a ratcheting up of the, um, of the commitments has to, be, has to take place very soon. So we expect to see uh, more laws and better laws in the next years. When we look at the, um, at the areas in which these laws cover, we can see that a lot of laws um, have 
traditionally been focused around energy laws and transition to low carbon economies. However, we also see that the um, laws focusing on climate change and explicitly um, low carbon economies have, rise, have been on the rise. What is more interesting to see that there has been a rise in the laws which deal with planning, especially in uh, lower income uh, countries, we see more and more laws that mainstream climate change into their general planning um, legislation. Since the Paris Agreement have passed, we saw 14 new laws and 33 new executive policies related to climate change. 18 of these new laws focused mainly on climate change, but four of them only specifically relate to the country's nationally determined contributions. We expect to see more laws explicitly acknowledging the NDCs and building on the NDCs because the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, have to be translated into national legislation and executive policies in order for them to be carried out. The least developed countries, which we now cover all of them in our, um, in our database, almost all of them address climate change in their legislation or policy, and this is a very welcome development and we're very happy to see um, that the least developed countries are going to mainstreaming their um, climate change policies with their planning and development plans. So what, is, what can we do with this resource that we're presenting to you today? There's a few things which um, both policymakers and researchers and of course other people can do with this. One of them is looking at this as a wide uh, research base which um, multiple research projects can be created upon. Two of these, for example, uh, have been carried out here. One of them looks at assess assessing the consistency of the national mitigation actions with the Paris Agreement. This is a study which has been carried out on G20 countries. And one of them is assessing the credibility, the political credibility of the pledges uh, for the Paris Agreement, with legislation being one of the key determinants for political credibility of the NDCs. Another thing that can be done with those, for example, is asking what can we learn from the number, from the focus of laws in certain countries? For example, if we look at the UK, we can see that the UK has 23 uh, climate laws or key policies. Does this tell us anything? If we take a deep dive, we can see that 15 of those laws look at the energy sector, which uh, is responsible for about a quarter of the UK's emissions. However, there's another 20% uh, um, which are 20% uh, of emissions which come from the transportation sector. These are covered by far fewer laws. And if we look at the agriculture sector, uh, at emissions from the, from the agriculture sector, we can see that there are no laws directly addressing emissions from that sector. And that in itself brings attention for policymakers and uh, enables them to perhaps shift their attention to, um, to other sectors. Finally, um, the, um, the existence of such a large database, uh, such a large body of climate change laws enables countries to understand and to feel that they are not acting alone. This has been echoed by policymakers worldwide when they were talking, when they still are talking to their opposition, when they talk to their constituents, when they try to advance climate legislation worldwide, and um, feeling that the world um, is not going without you and the world and you are not going without the world has been um, very important in this regard. I'm going to pass on the, the mic to Justin in New York. Before that, I would again like to remind you that we very well, much welcome your feedback on uh, the data included in this website, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Michal, and hello, the world. My name is Justin Vinlock. Uh, I am an associate research scholar at Columbia Law School and a fellow here at the Sabin Center. Uh, Mikhail just wrapped up talking about legislation relating to climate change around the world, and as promised, I am going to talk a bit about litigation. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about the report that Mike Berger mentioned, which he and I drafted, based on the cases that are now housed in 
the database to which you all have access. UN Environment commissioned that report, and as you see there on the left in those three bullets, it, it broadly deals with these three items. I'm only going to talk through two of those today. Um, the case components uh, are likely of interest to some of you, and you should go read the report, uh, but I think the numbers and the trends are more useful for this, uh, this session. So with respect to numbers, there is lots that can be said, uh, and I'm not going to say most of it. McCall and her colleague Joanna Zetzer have actually recently uh, talked in particular about a quantitative view of climate change litigation around the world in a paper. Uh, and so I, I would encourage you to look at that if quantities are, are what you're after. I will say just a couple things. Uh, I've highlighted the U.S. and Australia on this map uh, mostly to show that the U.S. is far and away the most litigious jurisdiction uh, when it comes to climate change cases. Those cases cover a variety of issues. They reflect diverse goals, uh, and notably, they include not only efforts to cause climate change to be addressed more effectively and rigorously, uh, they also reflect efforts to prevent climate change from being addressed. Australia uh, is also highlighted. As you see, they, they have fewer cases than the US. Um, but they are also a relatively litigious jurisdiction relative to others. The numbers uh, might be a bit small on your screen. They drop off pretty fast. Uh, generally in Australia, the issues that have been addressed by courts have, unlike in the US, at least in some instances, uh, not been quite as sweeping. Uh, they tend to focus on particular projects. Uh, some of those are in the energy sector. Some of those have to do with development on coastlines. But in any case, they, they haven't really dealt with Australia's national approach to climate change, which has been contentious and has gone back and forth. Uh, but court cases have not really addressed that directly. Uh, also, a general point before I move on from numbers is that, uh, of course, there's a temptation. And it's easy uh, when looking at numbers to infer significance from amounts. And uh, certainly, there is significance there. but. In the context of climate change litig uh, litigation, I am eager to point out that there are countries in which there are just one or two cases uh, that have come up, but those cases are hugely significant. Uh, the leading example is the Urganda decision in the Netherlands. Uh, there are others that have been filed since. For instance, um, in Switzerland, there was recently a case filed by a group of women who uh, style themselves, the, well, the translation is rough, but uh, the climate grannies or climate old ladies of Switzerland. Uh, there are not many cases filed in Switzerland, but this one could well push the Swiss government to alter its approach to climate change. Turning next to trends, in our report we identify uh, five current trends, that is, trends that are evident from litigation that has already been decided or that has been filed in um, will shortly be decided. And we've also identified two uh, what we're calling emerging trends, which are not quite as evident, but are in the offing. I'm going to talk through each of these. First up, and I would say first and foremost, is holding governments accountable. Uh, there are cases of this sort across Europe in a variety of different countries, uh, in Pakistan, in New Zealand, and of course in the US. Uh, these cases generally seek to enforce either statutory provisions or a combination of statutory and constitutional provisions uh, and generally allege that the national government, sometimes the state government, but usually it's the national government that is at issue, uh, is falling short of those commitments as interpreted by the plaintiffs. Several of these cases, especially recent ones of course, uh, refer to the Paris Agreement as well as other international agreements. And they don't do so because Paris is binding, but they do so because Paris provides a very useful context for plaintiffs, given that their national government, by signing on, stipulates to a certain set of goals and a certain context. That, in turn, is a basis for interpreting provisions, constitutional or statutory, that might not have been specific uh, outside of the context that Paris sets. So it has already become a feature of litigation efforts, and I think uh, we expect it only to persist in that way. Uh, 
second trend that we've identified up there uh, is what we're calling a linkage between resource extraction and climate change impacts. And this takes a number of different forms, but in general, the problem, according to plaintiffs, is when you dig fossil fuels out of the ground, when you extract oil or gas from deposits, often, even if the laws in a given jurisdiction uh, require you to consider environmental impacts of doing so, they often don't require either the agency responsible or the private actor responsible to consider the climate impacts because the relationship between the extraction and the combustion of whatever they pulled out of the ground is too attenuated according to the letter of whatever the law might be. So plaintiffs have sought to tether these two things more closely, that is extraction and then subsequent combustion. Uh, the issue, of course, is that the subsequent combustion generally falls within what is known as scope three emissions. So emissions that are caused by not the primary actor, but of some third party. And so efforts to tie the one to the other uh, often stumble because courts don't want to make a mining company responsible for the activities of the mining company's clients, even though logically, uh, if you pull coal out of the ground, it's not just going to decorate your mantle. You are going to burn it and it will emit. The third trend that uh, we've identified is another linkage. Uh, this one between particular emitters or particular emissions and particular climate impacts. This trend uh, is evident in a few different cases. Some have been brought against governments. Uh, there's one, it's, it, uh, we call it a case, it's an investigation technically in the Philippines uh, that actually seeks to parcel out somewhat specifically responsibility among what the plaintiffs there call the carbon majors. Uh, another which goes after similarly uh, private actor was brought by a Peruvian gentleman named Yuya uh, against Europe's largest emitter, that's RVA, the, uh, the German utility. That case was recently decided, Yuya lost. He argued that RVA was responsible not to pay the entirety of the costs that his town needed to incur to protect themselves from a melting glacier, but only the portion of that cost that corresponded with the emissions that the utility had put into the atmosphere. Uh, the theory is something like market share liability, others have heard about that. Um, in a, the, the point being it was an attempt to parcel out how much a particular emitter owed or was responsible for fixing the problem, uh, that is climate change, which of course is pretty difficult to parcel out. Uh, the initial court decision concluded that causation was simply too attenuated, that it was not possible to link the particular emissions that had caused trouble in Peru uh, to the particular emissions that had been sent up into the atmosphere from German power plants. Uh, that case is on appeal. Just two more. Uh, the fourth here is liability for failure to adapt. So when people speak of climate change uh, legislation, policy, litigation, I find they most often are thinking about mitigation efforts, efforts to prevent emissions, efforts to find some substitute resource that does not emit. Uh, but adaptation is a growing area and uh, one that increasingly features in litigation as well as elsewhere. There have been a few cases uh, that focus on adaptation, not as many as focuses on, uh, on mitigation. They've shown up in the US, uh, in France, and in Canada. And here again, causation is a very basic issue. Uh, it doesn't have to do with the specific responsibility for emissions. Here, the causal issue has to do with foreseeability. Did an entity that had some sort of duty to somebody else fail to perform that duty because there were foreseeable climate impacts? that it didn't take into account. Uh, one recent case was filed, hasn't yet been decided, in Canada, and uh, put this question in particular in relation to a set of lakes where the government Ontario of Ontario largely controls the inflow of water each year. Uh, and there was sufficient melt of the snowpack early in the season that, according to the plaintiffs, uh, the government of Ontario really ought to have foreseen 
that these lakes were going to be at dangerously high levels and flooding was going to be a possibility, uh, and yet precautions, again, allegedly, uh, were not taken, at least not thoroughly. So one other point to note here, climate change, the, the word climate change, do not feature in that case. And in adaptation cases in particular, you don't necessarily see reference to the climate context. Mostly you see reference to uh, a circumstance, an environmental circumstance that has changed. So these cases are, for our purposes, a bit subtle in that we like to rely on keywords and news coverage that refers directly to climate change and these in that respect can sort of fly under the radar. Uh, the last trend that we've identified in our report refers to the public trust doctrine. Cases that refer to one version or another of the public trust doctrine have popped up all over the world, uh, including in the US. The public trust doctrine uh, is effectively a doctrine that says government is responsible for maintaining the integrity of natural resources for subsequent generations. Um, there are other ways to state it, and you know, likely more eloquent ones, but for, for now, we'll use that as a shorthand. Uh, this doctrine, of course, logically can be implicated in dealing with climate change. As coastlines change, you are literally changing the shape of the country for which government is responsible. What is that government meant to do? So the crux of these cases has tended to be citizens' rights to a stable climate. That is, whether or not there is some law or doctrine in that country that provides such a right, and whether it has been articulated in such a way that it's implicated by climate change. Uh, those cases, for the most part, uh, are pending. So we'll see how different governments come out. I'm going to move now to the last two in this list of seven. These are emerging trends that we identify in our report. As you see, the first one there refers to climate refugees in scare quotes uh, for reasons that we discuss at, at some length in the report. It's uh, a, a term that threatens to become a term of art, but is in many respects a misnomer. And it's more useful to think of these cases as dealing with migration. That is, not necessarily migration across national borders, uh, often migration within national borders. To date, there are not many cases of this sort. However, there is a lot of migration of this sort, and there's every reason to think there, is, there will be much more, uh, again, both within a country and across borders. And it's unclear exactly which laws uh, will be implicated, exactly which, which measures plaintiffs will seek uh, in the context of litigation in order to respond to migration. However, it is it is a, a physical and economic trend that is so massive and so obviously tied to climate, uh, we're confident that we're going to see more of it as we pay attention to ongoing climate change litigation. Uh, so far, the cases on point uh, have chiefly come from New Zealand, and there are two, uh, both on our database, and I won't, I won't walk through them now, they're summarized there. Uh, the last item here refers to the Global South, and uh, what that reference is meant to convey is that Increasingly, climate change litigation is popping up not just in the U.S. and the EU, but also uh, in Colombia. There was recently an advisory opinion in Ecuador. Uh, there was recently a decision in South Africa about a coal-fired power plant. And there have been others in Pakistan and India, uh, all of which refer directly to climate change and reflect efforts on the part of plaintiffs and courts to vie with what it means uh, in a couple different contexts, though energy tends to be the primary one. Uh, we identify this as a growing trend, partly just because it has begun to crop up, uh, but also because given the amount of expertise that is developing in the world around this, this area, as well as the volume of domestic and international laws, and you just heard a bit about the growing volume of legislation, uh, this is fertile ground for more litigation, so we expect to see quite a bit more. The last thing I want to touch on briefly uh, is trends in the U.S. and uh, I, these three are listed in, in no particular order. Uh, I've already mentioned the public trust doctrine, so I'm not going to speak at length about it. I'll just to say that public trust doctrine cases in this country have been brought mostly in state courts. There is a, a federal case that's making its way, um, but the U.S. is no different from others in that this theory is being put here, uh, and we'll see what happens. Uh, resisting the Trump administration 
has, has made it into the slides. Um, this is indeed a trend that you can expect to see in the U.S. Uh, primarily, it, we expect, will take the form of fights over the regulatory process or the deregulatory process, as is more likely, and fights over federalism. So as states stand up and say, we're joining Paris, we're going to do our part, uh, we fully expect to see arguments made from various quarters about whether they can, how they can, and uh, what limits are placed on them by virtue of the fact that they are not a national government. Uh, I've also put liability for failure to adapt up there. This is in the same vein as the emerging trends identified in the non-US context. There have not been very many cases of this sort. However, uh, there are a whole lot of facilities on the coasts of the United States uh, that are susceptible to sea level rise, susceptible to storms, and subject to various laws, all of which would seem to implicate, well, concerns about adaptation. So even though the only cases that are out there I think can safely be called test cases, and the test hasn't quite been resolved, uh, we expect to see a lot more of this ill. And I'll wrap up there and turn it back to the full panel. Uh, as McCall mentioned, if anyone in their meanderings through our database spots cases that seem to be missing, seem to be off, please be in touch. We are eager for feedback. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Justin. Thanks very much, Michal. Um, we still have a uh, a fair amount of time for questions, and some questions have been coming in while uh, we listen to the presentations. Some of them are sort of more of the practical kind, that's the ones I feel capable of dealing with. Questions like, uh, will you make the slides available? Absolutely, we will. Um, in addition, of course, we will make the whole video available. Um, where can you find these things? They will be on the website of the Grantham Research Institute, so that's lsc.ac.uk slash Grantham Institute. Um, we've also had uh, at least one email of somebody who, came, or one comment, somebody came in and said there's a court case that we've missed. Thank you very much for that. I hope there'll be many more laws and cases that you can draw our attention to. So those are the, the, the sort of the easier uh, amounts of feedback we've had, but let me ask a more meaty question. Let me start with, uh, with Michal. Um, the question was, uh, we talked mostly about quantities, number of laws. Do you have a sense of uh, what a good climate change law should contain? What makes good climate change legislation? Hmm. So this is, a, this is a very interesting question. Thank you to um, our um, uh, asker, wherever you may be. And um, this is the question that we've been receiving over the years and have been um, um, gradually moving towards answering in um, maybe in a different way than what people might expect. Because while you cannot say this is a good climate change law because national circumstances make for such a huge difference between, uh, between the different countries, between the different circumstances, um, we do know that there are probably good modules to, um, to climate laws and these are more about the governance arrangements that are that are around the laws, how countries organize themselves around uh, implementing laws, what financial arrangements are made to make sure that laws can be um, can be implemented successfully, and, and so on and so forth. When you look at the database, and this is the, um, uh, the simple and direct answer to that, you will not know if a law um, is um, qualifies as a good law or a bad law. Uh, we do not analyze the quality of the laws um, yet, but uh, more research that we are working on will hopefully shed light on that question. Okay, thank you very much. Let's uh, find a question for, for uh, Justin, and I have a choice. Let me start with the observation uh, about uh, corporate shareholders and, and trends in um, what, what uh, shareholders of big companies like Exxon uh, can do to uh, complement litigation, I guess uh, the question would be Justin or, or Mike, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think in some respects that question has been answered in the last week 
by the shareholders of Exxon. Uh, you can hold proxy fights over what it is that uh, is included in corporate governance. And uh, you, you've seen different outcomes with different fossil fuel oriented companies or uh, companies like Exxon that play almost entirely in the fossil space. Uh, in this instance, I believe the, the fight was over uh, how Exxon must account for risk. Um, I know the Financial Stability Board that is uh, an arm of the G20 is currently articulating in a sort of stepwise fashion uh, ways for companies to think through climate risks and to make their exposure to those risks apparent to the public. Uh, as far as the linkage between this and litigation, uh, my understanding is that certainly shareholders could theoretically bring lawsuits for uh, a failing on the part of a company to abide either by the laws that govern uh, the reporting of material risk uh, or something more specific. But to date, I believe the effort of that sort has chiefly come not from private litigants or from shareholders. It has come from uh, regulatory authorities here in the United States, from attorneys general, and in particular from the New York attorney general, who I think just a couple days ago, it might have been Friday, announced that they have identified, uh, we'll call it aberrant or misreported uh, by Exxon of risks that Exxon characterized as a description of its environmental risk exposure and that the Attorney General, I believe, is arguing uh, mischaracterizes that risk exposure. Uh, I would, uh, sorry, Mike, sorry. go ahead. Yeah, let me just add in quickly. Um, you know, there, there's been a sort of long-standing effort um, to mobilize shareholders to push both for um, internal corporate governance around climate change and to push for uh, corporate disclosure uh, in securities and in other contexts around climate risk. Um, and that has come from uh, you know, networks led by a series um, for institutional investors as well as for shareholders. And, um, and as Justin pointed out, you know, litigation has arisen in this context, but it certainly hasn't been the primary mover of action to date. These investigations being undertaken by the New York and other states attorney general um, certainly seems uh, primed to, to push the envelope and move the needle on this a, a bit further. Okay, let me, let, me, let me stay with uh, colleagues in Sabin. We have a couple of questions that have to do with the, probably the question of loss and damage and whether there's uh, what the prospects are of countries like the Maldives uh, in, in securing through the courts uh, an element of compensation for the damage they suffered. So if the question is, uh, what are the prospects for uh, either international litigation um, or for litigation brought by a foreign country in a domestic court such as a US court to achieve compensation for, for loss and damages? Um, that's right, yeah. yeah. So, you know, well, it's a, it's a much discussed question and it's, a, it's an open question that hasn't, that hasn't been resolved one way uh, or the other. Um, I think that this probably isn't the, the appropriate forum to walk through all of the uh, ways that that game might be played. Uh, but the fact that that lawsuit has not yet been brought, I think, does point to the fact that much more might be achieved through international cooperation um, and through the international negotiation process under the Warsaw Mechanism um, and other potential avenues within the UNFCCC framework where loss and damage has been discussed for uh, a couple of decades now. Um, the, the prospect of litigation is certainly out there uh, and it is certainly feasible that a court in some jurisdiction might find liability and attach liability to some national actors or to some corporate actors. Uh, but we haven't yet seen that case uh, or that result. Okay, let's sort of turn back to Michal. Um, let's stay with developing countries. The question is, are there difference? If you look at the data, can you tell whether there are any difference in the laws in least developed countries versus the laws we see in uh, more industrialized countries? Thank you. Let me start by um, um, just briefly explaining that we're talking about 
a group called the Least Developed Countries. This is a group uh, consisting of 48 countries, um, which uh, are defined by uh, a combination of criteria of um, their um, low GDP per capita, a low human asset index, and a high vulnerability. Um, what we see about these countries ha who have been, as a group, far more vocal and involved um, than in previous years um, in the Paris Agreement, um, a very, very promising uh, development. We see that almost all of them, I think there's only four of them, um, which do not have climate legislation, but 44 of them have climate legislation and explicitly address climate change in their uh, laws and policies. This, um, this is in particular uh, importance to, to these countries because climate change uh, exacerbates the already high vulnerability that they uh, experience and uh, speaks directly to their national agendas of um, eliminating poverty and increasing their development. What we see is that these countries still have uh, a way to go because they have on average fewer policies than other countries. Um, this still doesn't mean that they don't have good policies. They're, most of their policies are in um, executive action rather than in legislative action, which um, either points to a different regulatory culture than in, other, uh, than in other countries or perhaps to the stage of regulation that they're at. What we can see is that more than other countries, these countries mainstream climate change into their development plans, again, because of the, close, um, of the close agendas of development, sustainable development to, uh, to climate change. And um, more of these countries talk about low carbon development and um, high resilience as a result of, um, of the climate change agenda. We uh, hope to see um, more and stronger policies for the LDCs, but we do see a positive development there. Okay, thank you. There's a question that I guess can go on both sides of the Atlantic, it's a set of questions on the role of climate change framework laws. And the question is, on the one hand, do they, what is their role within the sort of the architecture of climate change legislation? And then the question for Justin and Mike is, do we need more of those framework laws? Could they facilitate more litigation if you, if you have framework laws of the kind like the, the UK Climate Change Act? Let me start with Michal. Um, thank you. Uh, framework law is something that we've been uh, referring to in, um, in the study and in the database, and you can also search for policies or for laws that are defined as framework laws or policies. We refer to it as laws or policies that are overarching, comprehensive, holistic, in the sense that they address multiple aspects of climate change, either mitigation or adaptation or both of these. And uh, what we do see is that climate change uh, frameworks do encourage the passage of other laws. So when you address climate change holistically, you are more likely to then take a deep dive into the sectors later and to, um, and to legislate on these sectors. Justin, Mike? Sure. So I think the start of my answer, our answer to, to this question, is that it depends heavily on the framework law. The role that litigation tends to play is to answer questions, either about the applicability of a law or its implications in a particular context. Uh, a framework law could well wipe out the need to answer lots of que questions that would give rise to litigation by specifying in very clear ways who's responsible for what, how those standards are articulated. Uh, on the other hand, I could certainly imagine a situation where a country adopts a vaguely worded framework law and the implications as a consequence of that law's relationship to other environmental laws, other laws in the energy sector uh, is unclear and then gives rise to a field of new uh, litigation opportunities all intended to address the question of, well, what does this law actually mean? So I, I think that a framework law could frankly go either way uh, for the purpose of litigation featuring more prominently in this context and it would depend very much on uh, the content of the law. I would just add that the, you know, I, I, I think the irony of our answering this question can't be lost on everybody. You know, we here in the United States have been in a situation where we lack a framework law on climate change and the result has been 
um, years of so, some some 15 years of litigation around whether the Clean Air Act provides in the first instance provides authority to address the climate change problem um, and then in the second instance whether um, the US government's attempt to use that authority went too far or was consistent with the limitations that that law that clearly was not built to address the problem uh, raised and now the third iteration which will be a, a series of lawsuits filed over whether the attempt to move backwards on, on climate action is consistent with, with that, that law. So, you know, the absence of a framework legislation, at least in this instance, clearly has led to a great deal of litigation, not just in the Clean Air Act context, but in other contexts as well, involving energy, endangered species, environmental review, and, and other laws. The next question, I guess, is for uh, Sabin colleagues again. Uh, question of about training of lawyers. Do we need better training for lawyers, more trained lawyers, or does the legal profession know what they're doing on climate change? Um, well, I think that this, the, the, the resource that uh, Grantham and the Sabin Center have combined, uh, have partnered to put together, is largely intended to help further expertise, knowledge, and understanding around what climate change law is, uh, what its scope is, what it covers, uh, and what its gaps are. Uh, and so our hope is certainly that this tool will be part of a worldwide effort to uh, increase the legal profession's expertise in this area and therefore hopefully improve ultimate climate outcomes. The one small point I would add to that is certainly we hope that this provides, this resource provides a degree of education for lawyers, but also, and maybe even more so, for judges. Uh, we and, and others responsible either um, in the judiciary, uh, judicial context, or in other parts of government that are going inevitably to interact with the judicial sector. Uh, I think the, the question is meant to get at, are the lawyers good enough? And I think part of my answer certainly would be, well, the lawyers may be good enough, but what will matter most is whether the authorities they're arguing to are receptive. Okay, let's turn to Michal. Let's turn to Michal again. Um, a question about, uh, there's two questions actually I'm looking at here, um, about uh, how developing countries can make best use of the database and whether we have any um, plans of looking further at the gap between policies and uh, implementation of those policies. Thank you. Um, how can developing countries make use of this resource. So I think um, any country, but especially countries that are still looking to develop their legislation, um, can do a few things. First of all, they can look and see what others have done. Now, seeing what others have done can provide ideas on which sectors to look at, how to frame laws, how to frame ideas, what can be contained in the law, and so on and so forth. Um, seeing what countries that are similar to you in your, uh, in your region, in your environmental problems, in your um, regulatory organization or culture, looking at those and trying to understand who are your peers, who can you learn from, and then going to look and see what they have done, that is the beginning of the journey. Of course, we're not looking at a copy-paste exercise because that leads to bad laws if you do that out of context. Um, so of course, uh, just looking at the database is not enough, but it's a, it's a starting point. Developing countries and other countries can um, understand who they're speaking to when they, um, when they have bilateral interactions with other countries, usually knowing who you're speaking to and what they already have in place provides a completely different starting point for a dialogue because policymakers' time is limited, knowing and preparing uh, in advance and having this snapshot yeah, and of course, uh, not only policymakers, but also uh, analysts um, um, and uh, policy aides and so on. Having this resource at your hands is a, is a useful resource for that. Finally, in terms of the agenda that, um, um, that climate policymakers are trying to push forward, uh, again, I go back to the point about um, understanding that no one is acting alone on climate change. 
I'm pretty certain that um, the recent events with the, with the U.S. demonstrate that point clearly and the, the very clear response by the world of everyone is moving forward uh, has, has shown that, that uh, this very strong legal base is actually um, indicative of a clear, clear trend and this, uh, this data can be used to prove that point and I think it's well proven by now. In terms of planning to um, expand this knowledge base to understanding implementation, which is of course the big, the big next thing, I will go. Um, I will talk about one thing that we are doing right now, and that is a project that we're looking that we're doing right now and trying to understand governance uh, arrangements and institutional arrangements in many countries to understand how countries organize themselves around climate change. What kind of institutions do they have in place? What kind of financial arrangements do they have in place? How do the different ministries or agencies interact among themselves? We are trying to uh, aggregate data for that for about 100 countries. That's a project we're doing for the British Academy uh, right now with the British Academy. And um, that is um, something that we hope will shed light on how countries are better suited to implement their climate laws. One thing that uh, should be looked at specifically is uh, financial arrangements. Are uh, climate change laws budgeted for in the national budgets? Are there um, um, instruments that uh, enable the flow of um, climate finance into the country and the distribution of that climate finance efficiently in the country? Are there um, provisions for public-private partnerships that will allow um, um, climate projects uh, to happen and to happen rapidly and efficiently, those are the questions that we're asking. Okay, let's stay with you. It's sort of the next question is about the sectoral definition of a climate change law. A lot of the laws are on agri uh, sorry are on energy, and we sort of understand how that is defined. Um, but there are other important emission sources, and there's adaptation, where the delineation of what is a climate change law and what is just an agricultural law or the water law is, is less clear. How do we do that uh, sure. delineation? So w when we came about to, um, um, to asking yourself what laws do we include in the data set, we had to define a very clear scope. Um, the general scope of that is uh, consists of two main groups. One of them is laws that, ex that explicitly address climate change. So um, a general air pollution law would not count unless it talks about greenhouse gases in its pollutant lists. So we do not do uh, water laws if they do not talk about water uh, scarcity as affected by or contributing to, or sorry, or uh, uh, contributing to the, the climate change um, uh, agenda. So uh, explicit climate change is one. The second is transitions to low carbon economies. By that, we, will, um, we chose to include uh, renewable energies, energy efficiency, and so on. And um, those aspects, um, those um, sectors, or those elements um, are uh, perhaps not climate explicit. Perhaps they are driven by other agendas, such as uh, energy security, uh, uh, and so on. But because they, are, they facilitate transition to low carbon economies, they are in the scope of the data set. Adaptation um, is, of course, a tricky one because adaptation to climate change is so wide in its definition and so um, uh, entangled with other um, issues that it is um, very difficult to say what is an adapt adapt adaptation law. Um, health policies which respond to increased vulnerability by populations um, could be a response or an adaptation solution. However, we are not able to include adaptation, uh, we're not able to include any law that does not explicitly uh, relate to uh, climate change. We recognize that there are multiple aspects of adaptation which we do not include directly in our data set. One other thing to consider here is that adaptation is often done on the subnational level and so on things that are not on the national level, while the scope of this study, at this point at least, is only on national level policies. Okay, we have two more questions, um, both meaty ones. Um, let me start with the Trump question, or actually the, the whole long list of Trump questions that we have 
uh, accumulated. Uh, let me choose the one that is sort of, well, let's put it that way, the one I can read out aloud without blushing. Um, and it's of an interesting quirk. It sort of says, was Trump right to go out of Paris uh, if uh, the Paris Agreement can be used as a basis of litigation against the US government. Mike, Justin? So this has been a, a much asked question, uh, both because of the report that we issued together with UN Environment um, and the, the conclusion that we reached there that the Paris Agreement has been invoked by litigants uh, and by courts uh, in other countries. Um, and also because of just the general sort of curiosity around the relationship between the Paris Agreement and legal requirements in, inside the United States. Um, my, my short answer, and Justin may have uh, something to add or, or perhaps may even disagree with this, is that in the United States uh, there is no court that would find that the U.S. government is held to any particular requirement by the Paris Agreement. That is to say, a lawsuit that seeks to force U.S. EPA to establish any sort of emission standard or seeks to enforce to force the U.S. government to establish an econ economy-wide cap on greenhouse gas emissions uh, or to undertake really any other action, uh, none of those lawsuits would succeed for the simple reason that under U.S. law, the Paris Agreement is a non-binding treaty, that, a non-binding agreement that imposes no specific emissions requirements on the, on the U.S. government. Um, we do know that that argument was used by proponents for withdrawal both inside the White House uh, and elsewhere. Um, and uh, we've been very much, uh, I've been out there on record as saying that there's no legal merit to that argument in the context of the United States. I do imagine that there are other contexts, other countries where courts will take a similar tack. That is to say that other government, other courts in other countries may well find that the Paris Agreement though it provides, as Justin said, a context in which to understand the nature of national obligations to climate change does not, it does nonetheless provide no specific requirements on the, on the government. Do you have anything to add? No, I think that covered it. I, I would just re-emphasize the point Mike made about the fact that the administration made these arguments and the, these arguments are wrong. Okay, thank you. That was a suspiciously clear answer from a lawyer. Um, the, the final question uh, I, I have, uh, and apologies for, for the ones I uh, sort of bundled in the process of, of getting through this, is about the effectiveness of, of, of all those good actions by courts and by uh, legislators. Has it made a difference? Um, let me start with Justin and Mike. Have uh, court cases made a tangible difference to uh, emission reductions or the quality of adaptation, and then ask Michal the same thing about laws. Well, I, I think that uh, the answer is they've certainly made a difference for better or worse. I, I think uh, in many countries you see litigation on the part of someone who wants a government to do more, uh, and there often is not as much litigation on the other side. Uh, certainly in the United States, I would say that perhaps the most aggressive litigants have been those opposing efforts to reduce emissions, to address climate change. So uh, yes, litigation absolutely can be effective and litigation is not necessarily the tool that is going to be generative of, uh, of positive approaches. Uh, it is in fact, I would say, probably a better suited tool if what you're looking to do is cut down efforts to regulate. Uh, that, that's definitely a statement made with an American bias, but I, I think it is arguably general, uh, and I don't want it to be taken incorrectly, which is to say, I do think it's worth highlighting that litigation has absolutely put pressure on governments uh, in the Netherlands, in New Zealand uh, recently, there's a case there moving forward, in other countries as well, um, to take proactive steps. And I'll just add quickly that that's an important uh, point to raise. Litigation does not only serve the purpose of achieving a positive result in a court order that directs a government to do something that the government will then necessarily do. There are other positive results that can result from climate change, including the exertion of public pressure, um, the, the mobilization of public sentiment, um, and the recognition of fundamental rights uh, in, in some contexts. 
I think in some instances it's just too soon to tell. Uh, a lot of litigation, a lot of the climate change litigation that we've seen is is very new, um, and it's not yet ripe, or it's not you know it's too early to tell whether or not those those cases will result in concrete actions on the part of government. The final thing that I I would add is that. You know, to some extent, the success of litigation will be country dependent. National circumstances, again, are an important element to this whole picture. There, you know, a court order is only uh, as powerful as the rule of law in a given country. Um, and certainly, there is there is some concern that we will wind up with lawsuits that reach determinations or results that, like in many instances, that, that resemble the circumstance where we have laws already on the books. That are fundamentally ineffective because the laws are just not implemented. Similarly, court orders sometimes are made and, and then just not implemented. So, you know, uh, Nepal mentioned earlier that you know we're sort of hoping that this next phase uh, of climate law worldwide will be fundamentally about implementation, um, and that's as true for the end result of litigation as it is for legislation. Yeah. Nicole, have the laws made a difference? Well. Um, I think causality is a, is a tricky one, but let me to say two things on this. The first is that um, in 2013 we held a, um, um, a climate change legislation a summit here in London and we hosted Christiana Figueres, who was then the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and she said then, nothing will be agreed internationally until enough is legislated domestically. Uh, by that saying that the countries will not commit to anything substantive uh, until they are confident that they can carry it through. And I think that two years later, when the Paris Agreement was signed, um, I was encouraged because I thought that was, um, that was one way to see that climate change had made a difference, that countries were willing and able to take that commitment upon themselves. And the Paris Agreement in itself speaks in the language of, of domestic legislation and um, urges countries to act domestically and to uh, legislate and to implement their legislation. And that is uh, something that we see as a dynamic in climate change um, legislation, the, the, the moving forward and the reinforcing between the international and the national level. So, so that's, what, what, that's one uh, part of my answer. The second part, of course, is that legislation in all fields uh, and in climate change specifically is a signaling mechanism and signaling to the business sector, signaling to the citizens that this is the direction that we're going. Here are laws that are here to stay. You'll, work, you'll have to work pretty hard to reverse them. Of course, some countries still do that. But um, um, more and more countries have very solid mechanisms and institutions uh, anchored in laws that govern, uh, climate, uh, that govern climate change. By providing that signal to businesses, businesses are then able to take on commitments and longer term um, investments and to move the climate dynamic forward. And uh, so I think, yes, laws do make a difference. Let me just reinforce that last point uh, by referring to the UK, where the Climate Change Act of 2008, in my opinion, has made a huge difference in the way we in the UK look at climate change. It has put in place a sort of a mechanism, an institutional uh, setup that makes it very hard for, for governments to, uh, to ignore climate change. They can, you know, slow it down, pass insufficient policies, but uh, the whole idea of ignoring or reversing has become very hard to do in the UK. And since the Climate Change Act was passed in 2008, we have had governments that range from Labour, left of centre, um, to a centre government, the coalition between Liberal Democrats and, and, and Conservatives, and two Conservative governments, and uh, the Climate Change Act has stood the test of time. So good laws do make a difference. And that, I think, is a, a good place to stop, to thank uh, Mike and Justin in New York, to thank Michal here next to me, uh, to thank all of you, uh, whoever you are, wherever you are, for listening in, for asking questions, and uh, hopefully for continuing the dialogue with us. Uh, you've seen the, the email address that we have, Michal, Michal put it up. If you have suggestions, if you are aware of uh, legislative developments, let us know. Also, if you feel that I have ignored your questions and haven't passed it on to the panel, 
uh, do complain, send an email, and, and we'll get back to you directly. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a good rest of the day.